Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Tom Ball from Microsoft Research, and this is Ben Zorn. We co-manage the Research and Software Engineering area, and we're really pleased to have you here for the spring edition of the Programming Languages and Software Engineering Research in the Pacific Northwest Workshop. Um, it's been a, uh, some time in coming to get it over uh, to Microsoft Research, and I just wanted to give Ben a chance to say hello. Hi. Yeah, thank you. Uh Hey, thank you. Yeah, it's really great to have you here. Welcome to Microsoft Research. I'm looking forward to a really uh, interesting and informative day. I really enjoy all the participation from uh, the diverse uh, representatives we have. So please take the time to meet people from the area. They're probably people you'll see throughout your career. And so I hope this gives us a chance to both learn a lot technically and also uh, make new friends and uh, colleagues. Great. And we'll hand it over to Zach Tatlock, who's been the major organizer along with Amanda uh, at uh, the UW. Thank you very much. So uh, I just want to really quickly give people a, a sneak peek of what the structure of the day is like. Um, but first, welcome. Uh, you guys are a really good looking bunch. We've already had a lot of good conversations in the lobby getting warmed up. So I'm excited we should keep that going. Um, so throughout the day, we have sort of uh, three kind of big sections. In the morning, we're going to mostly be doing talks. And these talks are supposed to be 10 plus 5. And I'm going to sort of aggressively be staring you down as you approach 10 minutes. And we really do want to have some time for questions and, um, you know, see things for conversations in the hallway later. Um, then we're going to have a, a featured lunch talk and um, uh, a couple of uh, featured talks, uh, one from Gawa and uh, one from uh, UO later today. Uh, and then in the afternoon, we're going to have a poster session where we're going to set up posters. We have some easels in the back. And we're going to use the walls um, as well so we can sort of just see more of the work going on in the region. So uh, that's roughly what the day looks like. Um, I hope everybody, you know, there's food and snacks, so feel free to get up and stay caffeinated. Uh, I definitely wanted to thank everybody who uh, submitted uh, material to the, the workshop. It was really fun to review things. Uh, and thanks a lot to the uh, organizers, uh, Ben and Tom, and the program committee uh, for going through all the submissions and providing high-quality feedback. Especially wanted to thank Microsoft for hosting. And extra, I especially want to thank Amanda for really doing all the actual heavy lifting on everything. So, um, yeah. Hi, Amanda. OK, so with no further ado, I think we'll get the first talk off the ground, uh, which will be Dan Grossman uh, presenting some work on abstract interpretation. OK, perfect. Uh, so I want to talk about how to combine concrete and abstract interpretation. Uh, John should really be giving this talk. But there's a very short list of acceptable reasons for your advisor to give your talk for you. Uh, one is if you had your first child less than three days ago. So there's John. <laughs> He's graduating next year, and the work today will be the core of his dissertation. So this is, well, this used to be his baby, but now this is his baby. <laughs> so the promise of abstract interpretation, of course, is sound, useful information about programs without having to run them, and in fact, deriving facts that are true not just for a particular input, but for any input. And you know, no criticism here. This has been a huge success. You can have code with loops and data structures here, just arrays, but it doesn't matter. You know, even some non-trivial arithmetic, as long as you're in some sort of decidable, useful subset, and you get useful information out that we can use statically to reason about programs. And you know, this has been the success story until you kind of hit certain aspects of the real world these days, which is people writing applications that we care about and that we'd like to statically analyze against these enormous frameworks. And we've been thinking a lot about web frameworks, but don't worry about the word web, worry about the word framework, right? And what are these things? Well, they use massive amounts of metaprogramming in order to make themselves incredibly flexible and configurable. They tend to be rewritten in many, many layers of abstraction because they're taking care of the plumbing that lets you run anywhere. They're simply enormous, tens of thousands of classes, millions of lines, this sort of stuff. And a lot of your application behavior is stipulated by how you configure these applications in non-trivial configuration files. So none of this sort of fits your traditional abstract interpretation framework. So you have a few choices. You can rely on soundiness, which basically says, let's ignore all that stuff. It'll probably be OK. And the way metaprogramming and reflection is used in these frameworks, that really doesn't work. We tend to use reflection to set up the core control flow of your application. You could go sound and just say, well, I don't know what's going to happen. And then you'll be hopelessly imprecise, because you'll end up thinking that any of your methods can be called anywhere at any time. Or what people tend to do is 
take the framework that they need to build an application on top of it and build some sort of manual model that can then be used by static analyses for that particular framework. But we keep seeing bigger frameworks, more frameworks, more libraries, and it's just a lot of work. So what we'd like to do is maybe try a totally different technique that would let us statically analyze framework-based applications. So here's the way we think we can leverage a way to do this. We look at the frameworks and we say, well, there's two really hard things, the extreme flexibility in configuration files and the huge levels of abstraction and reflection. But on the plus side, there isn't a lot of branching in the framework code. right? That's not where the core control flow decisions are. So you can actually probably do exact, exhaustive concrete path exploration over that code. The problem is the application. The application has your unbounded loops, your complex branching, uh, interesting data structures that exact, exhaustive path exploration is probably not going to get very far. On the other hand, you have abstract interpretation, which has the reverse issue. It does really well with summarizing loops and things like that, but it struggles with these. So we don't think there's going to be a unified analysis strategy that will work uh, without a lot of manual effort and blood, sweat, and tears. So we'd like to just figure out a way to use both of these together in a sound way. And that's Concerto. Uh, and the idea of Concerto is a hybrid analysis framework that enables the precise analysis of framework-based applications without any manual modeling. Okay. So here's the idea is to hope that you could take the framework code and basically just run it. Now, it's going to be mostly concrete, and I'll explain that mostly a little bit in a few minutes. But then, when the framework code calls the application code, we'd like to yield to an abstract interpreter that wouldn't execute the application code. It would determine a sound fixed point of the behavior in traditional abstract interpretation fashion. And then when the application code called the framework code, it would yield back to a concrete interpreter. Right? And this is one of those things that looks beautiful in PowerPoint. <laughs> and then there's a ton of work to, to make it actually make sense and be sound and all that sort of stuff. And it's a little hard to convey in you know, 10 minutes. But let me try to give an example that gives a flavor of how you could do this. So here's some framework code. It's, uh, in main, it ends up opening a configuration file, which will end up setting up the control flow for the application. And then it yields to the application. Okay? So we're just going to try to run this. So when we see init with config, We'll just call init, and we will just pass config, and we will just run it. Okay? And the way we like to think of config is that it truly is part of the static text of the application. And one of our key assumptions is that we have it available at compile time. It will be the same at runtime. And we believe that for a framework-based application, that is a reasonable and acceptable assumption. Okay? So it's available at analysis time. We're just going to run it. It's going to end up building a map that says you know, foo, you know, the foo service maps to A and the bar service maps to B. And now we're going to call the application. The application is going to have some loops and some stuff. And it's eventually going to call some dispatch procedure back in the framework. Okay? We have to pass in some value for P. We are just going to pass in the concrete value, which is really weird because we're supposed to be doing abstract interpretation. But the abstract interpretation, the, the, the application is not going to mess with this map. This map is the framework's problem. It would be behind an abstraction barrier. So we can just reuse it concretely. And how can we do it? We make our second key assumption, and I promise this is two of two, right? that the framework and the application own disjoint sets of types. The framework types are opaque to the application, and the application types are opaque to the framework. Of course, you have to handle library types like integers and stuff like that but I don't have to do that in this talk. Okay. Okay. Uh, the framework types are manipulated only in the framework and similar for the application types. We call this the state separation assumption. The framework and the application own disjoint sets of types. So here we are. You know, on the framework side, it owns the map type, right? which is what it used to build up essentially this runtime data structure that is the control flow graph. Okay. Uh, and then over here, on the application side, well, because it's PowerPoint, it doesn't know what map is, but it knows what ints are. Of course, you would never seed ints to either side of the interface in practice, and the framework code won't know what type int is. OK. So uh, this is why it's mostly concrete. Uh, now we get to here. This is the second most interesting point in the example. So we're going to call back into the framework. And we still have p. So that's great. All right. 
uh, we have this constant string foo, but x we did abstract interpretation on. And for sake of example, assume we're doing a signedness analysis, and all we've tracked is that x is, non is strictly positive. Right? It could have been positive, zero, or negative. We figured out using plain old abstract interpretation, this point in the code, it must be positive. So now we're going to call back over to here. Okay? And for m, we'll just extract the embedded value back to the framework code. For the key, we know that that key is part of the framework, so that foo is fine. And for this, we will now embed the abstract value. And that's why it's mostly concrete interpretation instead of concrete. The framework, the concrete interpreter couldn't possibly deal with this value except to pass it around. And that's all it needs to do thanks to the state separation assumption. Okay? Okay, so now when we call invoke, it can figure this out. And it says, you are going to call A. All right? And in fact, you are going to call A with a positive value. Okay? And therefore, we can analyze A and we can figure out that that fail line is provably unreachable using plain old abstract interpretation. And better yet, this is the most exciting part, we know you didn't call B. All right? And so we don't get false positives from the analysis of B. Okay? All right. So in summary, we've essentially interleaved mostly concrete and abstract interpretation. We have the state separation assumption, and each thing can yield to the other uh, and embed its values in the other side. Okay? A lot of the work to date has been proving that this is all sound. Right? Uh, basically, you need to prove that mostly concrete interpretation is a sound abstraction of concrete interpretation. Then you need to be able to combine the two while maintaining soundness. And then, you know, uh, uh, everything I showed you on the slide is just a special case of the general idea of combining two things. So in my remaining minute, a little bit on implementation, we cooked up our own little toy language. It has a lot of the hard parts of doing this for a real language. Uh, the next six months, once John returns to research land, we'll be handling the rest of Java. We don't handle it yet. That's future work. Uh, but, you know, this, this is a lot of the hard stuff. So uh, it's my job to come up with the acronyms. We built a little framework called Your Analysis Worst Nightmare uh, that supports dependency injection, an embedded Lisp interpreter that can do arbitrary uh, foreign function calls back into our little subset of Java, uh, all sorts of crazy stuff, all done by configuration files. Okay? Then we wrote a simple application against it that responds to certain requests, comes up with answers, returns those answers. And then we wrote three different abstract interpretations uh, all within Concerto, compared the results of just running the abstract interpretation over all the code versus using mostly concrete interpretation for uh, the framework side. Okay, so three analyses of different flavors to kind of show that what we're doing isn't specialized to one kind of static analysis, all different kinds of abstract values. Yes, we can go uh, context uh, sensitive. Yes, we can handle access paths. Yes, we can be relational. Yes, we can be path sensitive. Okay, th this, this really does work. Uh, if you just use plain old abstract interpretation for everything, uh, in two out of three cases, we don't even finish in an hour. In the other case, we finish in three minutes, but we've got a whole bunch of call graph edges, especially compared to running with Concerto under 10 seconds. Right, and you know, two thirds fewer call graph edges, just much, much more precise. Okay, uh, okay. So you know, future work. Clearly, we got to handle a real language. We got to handle real frameworks and real analyses. On the formalism side, what we've currently done assumes a certain form of abstract interpretation, and you could relax some of our more theoretical assumptions. I don't think that's quite as high a priority, and I think I only went a minute over. Yeah, come. So is uh, this not just an abstract interpretation of a partial evaluation? Or are you doing um, something more intertwined? Yeah, uh, so is it right? So what's the connection to partial evaluation? It's not really partial. You know, clearly the reading the configuration file component say, oh, that's an early value. Whereas like bits coming in off the wire, you know, that's a late value. Um, so there's no residual program being created. Mm -hmm. Created So uh, uh, mechanistically, I would argue we're not really doing anything very much in the spirit of partial evaluation. But then the other aspect is, you know, you call between framework and application sort of a lot, right? You know, the, applica you know, the application is a whole bunch of a handlers. The framework is the event loop. Um, and 
you could try to do something where you created the like residual control flow graph in more of a partial evaluation standpoint, but it, it's just it's not how we've set it up, right? There's so, no well, early clear, the abstract values can flow into and be stored inside the framework state where yeah. they are yeah. opaque. Yep. But yep. Um, uh, I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sense maybe a little bit more like concolic execution. But yeah, and that's more what fixed point. point. Yep. Yeah. 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 We we actually used to call this concolic analysis, and then over the months we sort of learned that was at least for our thinking about what we're doing a less useful analogy. But certainly that's more of the spirit of where we came from. Yeah, Ben. Just a quick quick one. Have you seen cases where the the separation assumption breaks down? It's really um, like interface, or, you know, very generic interface types and very primitive types like strings and ints, yeah, yeah. right? Um, and then what you do is you still assume, okay, here, the separation assumption continues to hold. Uh, the way these frameworks are written is you really do have a procedural interface between the two sides. You do not tend to mess with shared state. It, what breaks down is the, is the disjoint type assumption, right? So you have to do something... Uh, uh, more sort of at runtime to just product domainy sort of stuff, like keep them separate, right? And notice that they're separate. Yeah. yeah. Okay. If okay. Any more questions for for Dan? All right. Let's thank Dan again. Uh, up next, we have Talia who's going to be telling us about uh, a new era that she's ushering in. She's blaring the trumpets in the name of proof reuse. And so, you know, you here are among the privileged few who are first to hear the gospel of a future world where we can effectively use these verification tools at scale in practice. So, take it away, Talia. All right. You're good. I just turned it on. Hi, my name is Talia, uh, and I'm going to talk about proof reuse. Uh, so, this talk includes ongoing work uh, with Nate Yazdani, Dan Grossman, and John Leo. Uh, but I'm also going to talk, as Zach said, about where I see the future of this field going. Uh, so you may have heard about these things called dependent types. Uh, and dependent types let you express types like the vector. Uh, so a vector is exactly like a list, uh, except that it also contains the length of the list at the type level. Uh, so the length of a nil vector is zero. And if you're consing on to a vector uh, to get its length, you just take the successor of the length of the vector you're consing on to. Uh, and this means that you know, whereas with lists, you have to write this length function yourself, uh, with vectors, whenever you have a vector, you already have a length. Uh, so you don't even have to write this function for length. Uh, if you did, it would just look like this. Uh, in addition to this, uh, this also means that there are a lot of theorems that you have to write about lists uh, that you just never even have to write at all about vectors. Uh, so this theorem says that nil and cons are not equal to each other. Uh, but over vectors, nil and cons don't even have the same length. Uh, so this premise that they're equal will never show up. Uh, so this is great. Uh, but unfortunately, for everything these offer, uh, these also come at a pretty high cost. Uh, so, for example, you might have a theorem like apnil r, uh, and this is a theorem from uh, the Cox Standard Library that just says that you, if you append nil to the right of a list, you get back the original list. Uh, well, over vectors, you can't even state this theorem using the same notion of equality, uh, because if you wanted to do that, you would need that these two vectors had the same type. Uh, and this would mean that they'd have to have the same length, uh, which means that these two lengths have to add up, uh, which means that this has to be true definitionally. Uh, so n plus 0 has to reduce to n. Uh, and while this theorem is definitely true in Koch, uh, it doesn't go through by reflexivity. It's not true definitionally. Uh, so the opposite direction, that 0 plus n equals n, does go through. But for one direction, no matter how you define plus, <laughs> you'll always need a commutativity. So thankfully, uh, you know, people have found some ways around this. Uh, one of them is to pack this into a sigma type. Uh, so instead of having a natural number and a vector, uh, you can pack it into a sigma type and say, I have some natural number and then a vector of that length. Uh, and then you can state your theorem pretty much as is uh, without any changes. Uh, but unfortunately, if you then try to prove that theorem, you end up with a proof obligation that looks like this. Uh, and I don't know about you, but I really don't want to approve that. So, uh, you know, clearly these vectors uh, come at a cost. Uh, and experts agree 
They're basically impossible to use. <laughs> okay, so this is where proof reuse comes in. Uh, so proof reuse is all about reusing existing proofs to derive new proofs. Uh, and this field has actually been around for a while, uh, but we're just starting to see some of the implications of it. Uh, so we're currently building a tool uh, that lets you, uh, it'll, it'll automatically reuse your definition of append over lists uh, to give you the version over sigma vectors. And then it will automatically take your proof of app nil r over lists, uh, and it will automatically derive that proof over sigma vectors. Uh, so this part already works. Uh, and that means that you, the programmer, never actually have to see anything that looks like this. Uh, the computer takes care of that for you. Uh, so, um, you know, if proof reuse has been around for a while, it might be kind of surprising that we're just starting to see some of its implications. And I think that's really because it came a bit ahead of its time. Uh, so it's been around since at least the 90s. Uh, now for reference, this was me in the 90s. <laughs> uh, so this is proof reuse. Uh, proof reuse in the 90s, people were already starting to think about how to build constructs for reuse into tactic languages and into logical frameworks. Uh, but I think in the 90s, we really had no clue what people wanted from these languages because we didn't have any large applications of these languages to anything yet. Uh, so while some of these uh, concepts uh, definitely are still useful, especially generalization, um, it turns out that you know, the actual languages uh, that had these reuse constructs uh, sort of faded away. Uh, now this was me in the 2000s, graduating high school, uh, and this was proof reuse. Uh, so in the 2000s, people were already starting to think about how to use uh, you know, proof reuse to solve problems that proof engineers really care about. Uh, so a classic one um, is dealing with isomorphic representations of types and switching between them really easily. Uh, but in 2000 and 2001, we really had no idea how to do this yet. Uh, so people could solve this for small cases, but they didn't have a general machinery that could handle this more generally. Uh, and so consequentially, uh, when people came out with calls for proof reuse, uh, so the Poppelmark challenge was a big benchmark suite, uh, and they, you know, they called for uh, several uh, different technologies uh, to make mechanized meta theory easier. Uh, and one of these was proof reuse. Uh, but the call for proof reuse was largely ignored. Uh, people focused on other parts, uh, namely on dealing with binders. But I think that all of this is about to change. Uh, and the reason for this uh, is not that I'm an adult. Uh, this is questionable. <laughs> but, uh, you know, now we actually have all of these technologies. We know a lot more than we did then. So this is just a small sample um, of technologies that have been used in the last decade uh, to, for new proof for use work. Uh, so we're using two of these, uh, something called ornaments and proof differencing. Uh, so, uh, you know, ornaments, uh, this is a way to describe how inductive types with the same inductive structure relate to each other. So using ornaments, we can say that a list, a vector, is exactly a list ornamented by its length. And then the tool can look at the difference, this is the proof differencing part, between a list and a vector, and it can discover that length is exactly this difference. And it can derive the ornament, and then it can use it to take your functions and proofs over lists and derive the versions over vectors. Uh, so, you know, these ornaments, these just came out in the last decade. Uh, they were introduced around 2010. Um, and I think that, uh, so, so when they were introduced, they were sort of introduced in a pretty theoretical context, uh, but one with dependent types. Uh, now, just this past year, uh, there was a really great paper, um, you know, applying this in a really practical way, uh, but in ML, which doesn't have dependent types. Uh, so we're looking to really find the sweet spot, you know, a practical application of ornaments, uh, in a language with dependent types, and specifically to solve problems uh, that occur in a dependently typed context. Uh, but overall, you know, I really think uh, that with all of these technologies uh, now behind us, uh, we really, really have an exciting future ahead. Uh, and it's going to be a future uh, that looks a lot less like what we have now, uh, and a lot more like this. Uh, and I can take questions. So thank you.
it, you know, it just strikes me that this sort of this notion of um, you know generalizing, right? You know, sort of these two things are the same except for the small difference. It seems like a very powerful mechanism uh, to apply uh, across a lot of things. Uh, so, you know, uh, what what are the in, uh, the most uh, pressing or opportunistic uses of this, uh, this approach in terms of you know, automating or um, making uh, proofs much more compact? That's a good question. Um, so I think the, um, I mean, there are a few directions I think this will go. Um, the problem with dealing with isomorphic structures uh, still isn't completely solved. Uh, so there have been a bunch of different uh, attempts at solving this, I think, that are all complementary. And I think that this is going to be one major use. Uh, but I also think that uh, with ornaments, you have the extra benefit that you don't need uh, you don't actually need things to be exactly equivalent. You can handle a little bit of extra data. Uh, so I think it's going to be automating a lot of the, the painful parts of dealing with dependent types and so on, and then leaving the, uh, you know, the extra obligation, the, the only interesting part of the proof, uh, to the human. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's sort of the power that's behind it. Oh, yeah. I like your mention of the mathematics community here. Like, do you think you can actually move to tools that are accessible to people outside of, let's say, like programming languages, or somehow eventually generalize the work you're doing to more general contexts? Yeah. So actually, proof reuse really, I think, sort of originated uh, at the intersection between uh, these interactive th theorem provers and the mathematics community, uh, because they're the ones who care, I think, more than anyone about dealing with these uh, like isomorphic types. Um, because in mathematics, you know, you could often just, you know, you'll, you'll have some proofs and you'll just say, well, these things are isomorphic, so it's good. But that's like a really hard concept for a computer. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, I think it was sort of born out of mathematics and I think we'll see some merging back in, uh, too, from what's developed in the programming languages community. Any more questions for Talia? types. I know that Tall Dan back there and I had some lots of fun with heavily <laughs> embedded dependently typed DSLs back in the day. I think that we could have used some of this stuff. Um, okay, well, let's thank Talia again. Up next, ladies and gentlemen, we have the great Max Wilsey, who's going to tell us the future about programming liquids. Okay, Max, take it away. <laughs> Thanks for the uh, introduction, Zach. Uh, so, hey, everybody. Uh, uh, I'm Max, uh, and I'm going to be talking today about Puddle, which is a uh, high-level uh, system for microfluidic programming. And uh, don't worry if you don't know what microfluidics are. Uh, I'm going to tell you I didn't know what they were one year ago. And this is joint work between uh, me. I'm in the Pulse Lab and the uh, Missile Lab, which is the Molecular Information Systems Lab uh, at UW. So there's a whole bunch of people in the lab, including a bunch of undergrads, uh, one of whom, Christine, is hanging out here. So come talk to us afterwards if, you're, if you find any of this stuff cool. So what are microfluidics? Broadly, microfluidics is a kind of technology that lets you manipulate small fluids. Uh, and why would you want to do this? You know, if you want to automate any sort of chemical or biological experiment, you know, it's going to be expensive to have grad students running around in the lab pipetting, you know, things from one tube to another. So the way you automate this is with, you know, microfluidic devices. And this is just a video of one kind of device. I'm going to show you uh, some others later on. Uh, and like I said, you want to use these to automate experiments. But unfortunately, uh, these aren't really used for experimentation very frequently because there's this, this abstraction gap. And so at the bottom, you have these really cool, really capable microfluidic chips. And at the top, you have all kinds of experiments or other domains that you might want to use these things for. So not just automating experiments, but you might want to use these things to automate steps for uh, molecular computing or DNA storage or something like that. Or even you know, medical diagnostics, like you could imagine doing point of care tests in the field uh, using something like this device. And of course, all of these applications draw from a lot of domain knowledge, right? And they're separate for the different applications. And the things I'm going to be talking about today is the way I think we can bridge this gap is twofold. First, there's a lot of complications in the hardware. These things are uh, quite difficult to program. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about abstracting uh, away this hardware with some operating system-like techniques. And, and then finally, on top of that, can we get some sort of static guarantees about uh, the safety of programming these devices with uh, extensible fluid semantics? And when I say extensible, I mean we need to talk a little bit about how do we use knowledge from these uh, you know, various crazy domains, but also there's something inherent to you know, manipulating fluids, and how can we do that safely? 
So that's going to be the outline for the talk. I'm going to work from the bottom of the stack up. So first, let me tell you a little bit more about microfluidic chips. So this is like a uh, you know, one minute history of microfluidics. Uh, on the left here, we have channel-based microfluidic devices. And here you can you know, kind of see a tiny little channel. This is just an etched tube, basically, and you know, some sort of uh, polymer. Uh, and this is a, these devices are really effective. They're very cheap, but they're also fixed function, right? You, know, you, you fabricate the device, and it does exactly what you fabricate it for. And then in the middle, this is kind of the, the state of the art of uh, lab automation right now, are uh, pipetting robots. So this is basically a mechanized uh, grad student. You know, it, it moves arms, and these things are like you know, this big, and you know, they're human-like. They have arms, and they move pipettes around and pick things up from one test tube. And then on the right, we have uh, digital microfluidic devices. So this is the video I showed you earlier. This is actually a chip uh, that we uh, built in-house at UW. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the pros and cons of these devices. But the analogy I want to make here is that we kind of saw a similar trend with electronic computing. You know, first, you have circuits, you know, which are really effective. They're simple. And they do one thing really well. But of course, people wanted general purpose computing. And then we built that. But at first, it was you know, huge, clunky, and expensive. And of course, now you have you know, general purpose uh, computing in your pocket. And I really think that these digital microfluidic devices could offer the same sort of revolution if we can you know, actually program them. So like I said, these are digital microfluidics. And the reason we call it digital is because we're not working with you know, uh, continuous quantities of fluids. You know, they're, they're kind of broken down into individual quanta. So here you have a grid of electrodes. And if you turn on the electrodes just right, you can move droplets of water uh, around. You can mix them. You can split them. And this provides the basis of really doing any sort of you know, chemical or biological automation you might want to do. So as you can see, uh, you know, with the thumbs up emoji, it's really general purpose. You can do pretty much anything you would want. Uh, it's also extensible. You can't really tell, but the bottom row there, those little legs jutting down, those are heaters. So you can heat up those tabs. And you know, for your biological protocol, you might want to heat up a sample to you know, expedite part of the reaction or something. And you can also see you know, the kind of parallelism we can get. You know, if you build a bigger chip, you can do more things. And that's a you know, familiar notion uh, to us in computer science. But on the downside, they're a real pain to program. The way you program them basically is you, you know, write down a sequence of electrode actuations. right? So at time one, turn on these electrodes. At time two, turn on these electrodes. Uh, and this is obviously cumbersome because what you really want to talk about is you know, making sure the droplets in the right place at the right time, or even better, just say, let's mix these together, and let's split them, and let the computer figure out where do we put these things, when do we you know, run these operations. And there's also uh, physical errors on the device. And so you're not seeing any errors now, um, but you might try to move a droplet, and it just won't move. Uh, and there's also a notion of precision loss. right? If you try to split two things apart, you want a 50-50 split, but you might not get it. And so <clears throat> all of these things sort of cascade to make these things uh, very difficult to program. And I think this is why we're not seeing people use these for complex experiments. Uh, so yeah, these are just some of the problems that you would exper uh, experience while programming these kind of devices. Uh, I'm only going to get to talk about a few of them today. But you know, if you want to come talk to me about any of these other issues that you might experience, I'd love to chat with you. So we obviously need to abstract away some of these hardware details. Uh, and this is the kind of programming style I think we would want, right? So you know, you're writing in some sort of high-level language. You notice that we have no locations, right? We're not referring to where the droplets are or, or when we're doing sort of operations. We're kind of just sort of specifying, you know, the operations that we'd want to do at a very high level. Uh, one thing that you can't see here is we're not dealing with errors, and that's good uh, because the system we would want to deal with these tiny little errors, like oh, the droplet didn't move automatically, right? It, it would be a pain to you know try to detect and correct these throughout your entire you know program, which has complex control flow or whatever. And another thing, which is kind of taken for granted in a lot of the work in this field, is we want to write programs that have control flow and functions. And so in this you know example program that I've given now, things like mix and heat would be primitives. These would actually you know correspond to things that you would do on the device. But git ph or acidify, and of course foo here, could be user written procedures. right? And, and of course, functions and control flow, we take for granted any programming language that we find interesting. But a lot of the uh, past work on programming microfluidics has not really specified this. It's mostly been straight line code, which isn't really code in the sense that we think about it. So I think this is the sort of picture that we want. But unfortunately, this means we have to do a lot of things dynamically. Uh, and, and this is a contrast to a lot of the existing work in microfluidics, where you basically give me a graph of operations and let's run them on the chip. So in particular, if you have things like data-dependent control flow, like that's going to be hard to write down the graph for, right? Like you don't know what the pH of this thing is. So 
you know, it's going to be hard to figure out, like, how do you specify, you know, what's going to run on the chip when. You, this is something you can only find out at runtime. And furthermore, as I said, you really want this on-the-fly error correction because the hardware error rate here is on the order of like one to two percent of operations are going to go awry. And so, you know, if that's what your you know, what your silicon chip did, you would definitely have some sort of you know on on the fly monitoring. So yeah, and, and I think for that reason, we really need to approach the, some of these things dynamically uh, because we need to get those uh, those errors corrected, and we want to use these high level programming constructs that you know we of course take for granted. But on the, on the flip side, we lose all static reasoning about resource usage. So in you know, the framework that I just showed you, you could definitely write a while loop that is just while true, like let's just keep putting droplets on the chip. And of course, you're limited in your physical resources. There's not that much space on the chip. And you will run out of room and the program will crash. And so <clears throat> I think uh, once, once we can get this down, we can start using things like programming language techniques to get some of that static reasoning back. Uh, and I'm probably running close on time, and I'm going to briefly talk about what that static, static reasoning would look like. So this is where we are now. Uh, oh, and we can actually write code like this today and run it uh, through our framework on the microfluidic chip. And it'll do you know, things like error correction and automatic place and route, so you don't have to worry about where things are. But you can also write buggy programs like the while loop that I just described. So how can we use the notions of how do you safely manipulate fluids to automatically and statically uh, take care of some of these issues? So one sort of obvious first take is that uh, when you manipulate fluids, there's sort of a, a linear aspect going on, right? If you use a fluid, it's gone, right? The, the variable no longer corresponds to something that exists in the real world. So here I've slightly changed our example program with this line at the bottom that is now going to mix A and C. Uh, and this while loop, you know, it's probably going to take a long time. These actual steps that you know, happen on the chip take you know, about a half a second. So you know, the chip is moving pretty slow. And this is going to crash. Uh, because we already used A, right? We, we mixed A up here. And so the pure A, you know, whatever, if it's an acid or a base or whatever, is, is gone. So this is just going to have to crash at runtime. But thankfully, we know how to deal with this. We have linear types. You can analyze this program and say, statically, like, uh-oh, you used A, but we already moved it, or someone else owns it, or, you know, it's, it's been consumed. But unfortunately, uh, linear is not really enough because there's these complex relationships between uh, the volumes of these substances. So we're not really just concerned about whether or not they exist, but how much of them exist. So let's walk through this short program uh, and talk about what the volumes uh, of these various things would be. So you know, at the very top, we kind of start with you know, we have A and B, and we're just going to say that you know, A has type A, which is some volume, and B has some type B, which is another volume. And so immediately, we experience some sort of constraint uh, on, these, on these types. So of course, you know, when we mix two things together, the volume is going to be probably the sum of their volumes. Uh, but here, we're wanting to mix them in a, in a specific ratio. This would be a 2 to 1 ratio. So there's twice as much A as B. And you might want this to you know, make sure your chemical reaction works out or whatever. And so we have some sort of uh, side constraint here. So the A needs to be twice as much as B. And in this, you know, <clears throat> this incurs a precondition on calling this function, right? So if you call you know, the function foo, you better call it with twice as much A or B. Now, you could also imagine a little bit more flexible semantics uh, to calling this, where instead of giving it precisely twice as much A and twice as, mu or twice as much A than B, you just give it enough that it can figure out, you know, I can split some off and, use, and have twice as much A and twice as much B. But if we make the program a little bit more complicated, so here we're uh, taking the result of that mix and we're splitting it in two and throwing away one half, right? So this would basically just be like, you know, we're mixing them together and just taking half of the result. Uh, so another constraint of the hardware that I did not mention is that because we're, you know, working digitally, there's these little electrodes. If the droplets get too small, you can't move them around. The droplets aren't going to be touching the neighbor, neighboring electrode and the physics just don't work anymore. You can't move the droplets. So there's a sort of minimum quanta that you can manipulate on these devices. And so you would obviously want to make sure that you know, the droplets that you're manipulating stay above that minimum quanta, otherwise you're going to break. Uh, so here you can see that this would incur another uh, constraint uh, on, the types of, uh, on the types of things you could call foo with. And so did, does anyone know how much time I have? I don't have a clock. Oh, it's zero. Oh, zero. <laughs> All right, so I'm just going to blaze through this. Right. <laughs> so just going to blaze through this. Basically, if you want to reason about some parts of the program, uh, you're just going to be totally out of luck because these things deal with physical 
intrinsic chemical properties of the sample, right? So if you wanted to reason that this loop is going to terminate, you need to know that acidify is going to raise the pH, and you need to know that get pH is going to get the pH. <laughs> right now, we can read this and say, like, yeah, sure, this loop is going to terminate. Uh, but these are user-written procedures, and the way that this thing gets the pH isn't calling some primitive. It might be doing, you know, some sort of litmus test like you did in, you know, uh, in, in chemistry class, and might be using a camera or something. So it's not obvious this terminates. And so uh, another big question is how can we get the user to add this sort of domain knowledge in, uh, into the program so we can do, perform these types, types of analyses? So I'll just blaze through that. Yeah, so there's a bunch of other things that I didn't get to talk about uh, that I would love to talk about, so please come at, ask me afterwards. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So I think you did a very nice job of, you know, sharing with us all the differences in this domain. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that the capacity and geometric constraints are very much like circuit layout, right? right. And are you reusing some of that, you know, decades of experience and then adding the chemistry on top, or is it? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the, the place and route sort of thing yeah. is, is exactly the same techniques. Um, in fact, most of the work from this, in this community right now is kind of stuck in VLSI, which is why it's all just like, let me take this big graph and reduce it to some ILP problem and then optimize it and place it in the best way. So yeah. we know how to place and route really, really well. Unfortunately, we only know how to place and route really boring programs. Uh, so that's kind of the state of the field right now because of where it came from. Thanks. Yeah. Any questions? Do you always keep a bag of rice handy? Why, Zach? Because you get your computer wet. You have to. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> any other? Do you want to go ahead and set up? Oh, yeah. Sure. yeah. Uh, any more questions for Max on microfluidics? Yeah. So uh, I guess in in distributed systems, there's this trade-off between like whether the application handles errors or whether they're handled by some layer of abstraction below you, and that that's that's something that people argue about. Mm -hmm. um, are there any applications that might be able to do domain-specific error handling that wouldn't want your OS abstraction to be handling errors for, for it? <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, so, you know, specifically an operation like, especially in the digital domain, if you want to do like a, di a dilution because you're working with uh, fixed quanta, you have to do like a you know, exponential chain dilution. Uh, and there you might want to, you know, capitalize on the error of the system. So when you split things apart, as I said, you might incur some sort of precision loss there. But we have a camera on it, and you can tell how big the droplets are. And, you know, maybe one of those works out better for your dilution. So, yeah, there are definitely applications that might want to, you know, bypass the sort of error correction. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Let's thank Max again. Um, Take it away, Stuart. Just a second. Let me get this in the presentation mode. Thank you for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Stuart Grant. I'm from the University of British Columbia. Today, I'm going to be presenting work that will appear at ICSI in, at the end of May. Um, and my work is on inferring invariance in distributed systems. My goal here is to try to motivate some of you guys to apply your program analysis techniques to distributed systems and to kind of, yeah, just to motivate program analysis in the context of distributed systems. So why would you want to do this? Well, distributed systems are pervasive. You use them every single day. And virtually every application that has a serial version that would run on a single machine now has a parallel that is run in a distributed context. For example, um, data analytics. Performing um, reasoning on big data requires that you, does not require, but you use streaming services like Spark or Hadoop in order to analyze big data. Distributed systems also have desirable properties like fault tolerance. So in the case of a database, it's now common to replicate it and use something like ETCD or Paxos in order to replicate your data. Unfortunately, distributed systems are notoriously difficult to build. They're naturally concurrent. You're, regardless of the system that you're running, it's going to be in multiple processes and potentially on multiple machines. There's no centralized clock which is another complicating factor. You also have to reason about partial failures. So the network is not always constant. And because of this, the composition of your system can change dynamically. And the developers of distributed systems need to reason about this, and it complicates their code. And finally, well, not finally, but importantly, the network is not static. 
different applications that are touching the network can interfere with the way that your application runs, and you need to be able to reason about this as well. In order to develop correct distributed systems, there's a number of academic approaches, including verification, bug detection, runtime checkers, tracing, and log analysis. These first three require specifications. Tools like verification use specs in the form of data invariance as search criteria to find errors. Um, in the bug detection world, and here we've highlighted MODIST, which is a, like a model checker, they'll also use invariance as termination criteria in order to determine if a bug is real or false. And in runtime checkers like D3S, they have a global observer that performs assertions on your program. The goal with our project is to mine distributed invariants automatically. And we want to handle real systems when we do this, and in the most general context as possible. In particular, we want to have an arbitrary number of processes. We want to only assume that processes are communicating using a message passing system, handle things like lossy or reorderable channels, and address things like joins and failures. So again, our goal is to infer distributed invariants. So what does a distributed invariant look like? Well, one example of which would be something like distributed mutual exclusion. So you've got a bunch of processes, and they want to access something like a critical section. So that would be the example over here on the left. We've got three nodes, one of which is pinging the other one, and the other one's requesting a lock from one that has it. And an example of an invariant here would be that only one of these processes is in the critical section at a time. Another example of a distributed invariant would be something like key partitioning. So on the left, we've got some key value store, and none of the nodes share any state with one another because you don't want to do any sharing because it's slow. And there's a broadcast from a client, and only the node that keeps the data returns it. So the invariant there would be that none of the keys across any of these processes are shared. And if you've implemented your system correctly, these should hold at all times. Some invariants are trickier, and they hold on in protocol-specific situations, but for the sake of this talk, we'll keep it simple. And I'm going to use this as a motivating example. Um, so today's talk, I'm going to just introduce you guys to a bit of the analysis techniques that we used for this project and sort of the problems that we had to face. Uh, there's two sides of it. There's a static analysis component where we extract important variables from programs automatically. And then there's a dynamic approach where we actually examine the logs and extract invariants from them. So one of the big problems in distributed systems is that they're gigantic. There's a huge space of variables, and determining which ones are important is difficult. Our technique to trim this space of variables is to actually detect which ones interact with the network automatically. And we do this using interprocedural program slicing uh, by marking network reads and writes and only logging variables that are actually affected by the network. We also automatically inject logging statements into the code um, that contain these variables. One of the other tricky problems, like I mentioned before, is that there's no, there's no centralized clock. So reasoning about the position or the, the time in which variable values hold across separate processes is very tricky. What we use is uh, vector clocks, which establish a partial ordering on the execution so that you can reason about time across separate processes. And we inject these automatically using a static analysis technique. And it works roughly as this. So any time a, a message is sent over the network, we wrap it with a vector clock, which simply just keeps track of time on individual processes. And when it's received, we strip the vector clock off and return the original message back to the application. So this is just a mechanism for reasoning about time. Unfortunately, it's not very precise. Uh, the space of partial orderings is absolutely gigantic, as anyone who's worked with uh, partial orderings before might be aware of, and just a concurrent system. So the, the second large problem in this project is reasoning about global state. So what's a global state? A global state is the composition of variable values across the whole set of processes in your distributed system. The way that we capture these is an interesting automatic process. Um, it's it requires that you reason about all points in time that could be consistent, and then analyze those in order to try and extract the important state. And the, that part isn't the most amenable for a 10-minute talk, so I'm going to flush over it. Um, and we're going to talk about how we extract interesting parts of uh, the protocols. 
So one of which is that after we've collected a global state and ensured that it's consistent, um, we use a series of transitive message trackings in order to kind of tease out the protocols f that uh, occurred during runtime. So one example of this would just be after this, uh, this ping and this get walk message were issued to us, that small cluster we talked about before. We traverse the, uh, the messages and collect that as a single global state. On another execution, we might want to, one issue with uh, inferring these invariants is that you want to have a lot of information about your program. So you want to collect these across multiple executions. And when you have similar series of message sequences, we can group them together. We have a number of heuristics for analyzing the state of distributed systems. The transitive one is great if you want to follow a protocol. Sometimes it's better to just collect all the global state at once. And for that, we have a different method, which is highlighted here in blue, where we would just take the frontier of this log and aggregate it together. When we have similar sequences of protocol executions, we group them together and then pass them to DICON for invariant inference, for those of you who are familiar with DICON. Um, so this style of invariance that you would get out of this would be a a variable prefixed by the process or the node that it's on. And th this is a, these states are global because we've aggregated them together. So you can infer invariance across distinct processes. One other component of this work that's kind of interesting is that we enforce these invariants that we inferred automatically using a distributed assertion mechanism. It's, uh, it uses a small amount of time synchronization to schedule snapshots into the future and then reconstructs the global state using these vector clocks. I'm a little short on time, so I'm going to skip through this. So we evaluated this on a number of large systems. Uh, ETCD, which is a large-scale database. Uh, SURF, which is a gossip protocol. Uh, a torrent engine, and um, a memory caching algorithm. Uh, all of this is written in Go, which is why we have the little gopher behind you torrent and memcached. Uh, so an example of one of the systems we analyzed is ETCD. It's about 120,000 lines of code. Um, and we were able to infer a number of key properties about this system, uh, one of which would be the strong leadership property, which if any of you are familiar with Paxos, one of the optimization of it is that you have a leader. And in the case of Raft, the leader is only able to issue requests to the followers to replicate a log. And we were able to detect this by measuring the log size and comparing it between followers and leaders in this algorithm. We were also able to inject um, silent bugs that violated these invariants and catch them using our assertions. So limitations in future work. Um, unfortunately, our dynamic analysis technique is incomplete. It's optimized in order to handle large-scale systems and like extremely large executions, but it falls a little bit short in that it uses a heuristic in order to infer these invariants. Um, it also doesn't support temporal invariants. That's future work for us. We have a number of projects that are using these uh, inferred invariants, such as bug isolation, test case generation, and uh, mutation testing. Or specifically validating the quality of distributed test suites using distributed mutation testing. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so our work, we infer distributed data invariants. We uh, implemented a, an algorithm for asserting them at runtime. Uh, we have an open source repository, if anyone wants to check it out, and a demo online. Thank you. Questions? I have a question. Yeah. Um, so you, you mentioned that you ship state around and then uh, reconstruct what the global state must have been in the past. So that means in like... In the case of the assertions, yeah. Yeah. So when you get an assertion violation, it could be sort of arbitrarily far in the future. You figure out like a long time ago something went wrong. Uh, so what happens is that the asserter pauses itself. It schedules an, uh, a snapshot to happen in the future. And then all of the other nodes synchronize and attempt to snapshot their state at a, the same time. Then they just incast all of their state to the asserter. So yeah, definitely, it happened in the past. Um, the notion is that the asserter is just in charge. So the asserter is sort of scheduling, like, every once in a while, we're all going to sync up, check the global invariants, and then move forward. Exactly. So you would use this more for, like, a debugging 
purposes, probably. Yeah, so it's interesting that you mentioned that. It's debugging and actually production as well. We implemented these algor this assertion algorithm so that it's probabilistic. So you can turn it up to a probability of one, and it'll assert every time it's executed. And then you can actually turn down the probability on it so that it'll assert every once in a while, because it's a little bit expensive. Right. Cool, cool. This sounds super useful, but my intuition is that the useful invariants are sort of a little more implementation oriented than you might want mm -hmm. in other settings. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm curious, just your experience in practice, right? If I run this over a leader election algorithm and you infer that there's never more than one leader, my reaction is probably like, yeah, thanks. You know, like, mm -hmm. that was the point, right? Like, do you see that? Uh, yeah, so never more than one leader is actually a pretty strong property, though. Okay. You can imagine that if you were doing like a huge amount, you can imagine that you find the invariant that there's not more than one leader or that there is more than one leader. Well, it's certainly right. From a debug, right, yeah, yeah. So if you've got a huge execution and you're, you, you're not exactly sure what went wrong, but you've, you can pass this to this invariant miner and it'll tell you, well, you know, in the past, you had a number of correct runs where you didn't have more than one leader, but that invariant's broken now. So in that, essentially looking at uh, invariant violations in order yeah, to detect totally that. Yeah, totally buy that, for, but, the, but the invariant detection piece, you know, it's, you know, the question is, is it hard for me to write down, I don't expect there to be more than one leader, right? And, you know, it's, it's convenient if I don't have to, but, mm. right. I, sorry, I should have <coughs> said this. The, um, the invariants that are inferred are general, so you don't actually specify any of them ahead of time. You check the output of the mind invariants yeah. for the ones that you're looking for. I think uh, oh. probably it's not hard to write them. Probably it's hard to think to write them. <laughs> okay. That is, there may be a bunch of properties you wouldn't have thought to write or you wouldn't have thought to write in that way. And, uh, you know, maybe even in addition to the one main thing that you would have thought to. And that, that's exactly right. The one main thing, you're probably, if I'm doing leader election, if I'm going to write down one spec, that's right. probably it. But there's probably another class that you wouldn't think to write down that are very helpful. Yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah. Just a hypothesis. Yeah. Uh, so when you're doing verification on distributed systems, you uh, need to you know make your invariants inductive, uh, and for that you almost always need to talk about messages in the network. Uh, have you done any inference uh, that includes like state in messages? No, we haven't. The, Can you repeat the question. Uh, so the question was when you're doing verification of distributed systems. You need to do inductive proofs, and this often requires that you reason about the, the state of the messages that are resident in the network. And his question was, have you done any work inferring invariants on this state? And the answer to that is unfortunately no. Uh, this work is done exclusively uh, with state that's resident on the machines. There's no reasoning about the network. It's treated as a black box in this case. Maybe in the future. Any other questions? Okay, let's uh, thanks Stuart again. Thanks everybody.